Well, welcome everybody. Thankful that you're here in the room or online with us. It's going to be a good day. Each year from uh, Mother's Day to Father's Day, I typically teach on relationships, some angle of it. And so today we're going to start uh, a four-week teaching just about dysfunctional people. And so we're starting off a little lighthearted with that bumper because uh, a lot of times our our lives and relationships can be very, very heavy, right? So uh, how many of you would say, you know, what I really want is I want my relationship to be full of fun, life-giving, and enjoyable. Just raise your hand if that's what you want. Fun, life-giving, enjoyable. That's most of us. Uh, that, that shouldn't surprise anybody that we want that. You were created for that. Reagan and I were uh, studying in Genesis 1 and 2 this week and just noticing how Adam and Eve's relationship, when God made the first man and woman, their relationship together was absolutely perfect. It was fun. It was life-giving. There was mutual blessing and encouragement. There was mutual acceptance. It was an amazing relationship right up to the point where they decided to walk away from God and do their own thing. And then literally uh, all hell broke loose. And there was a lot of blaming and shaming and hiding and things like that. And so now here we are, we're living under that same umbrella of mess. Instead of love and joy and peace, many of us are living with pain and fighting and frustration, maybe even uh, resentment and regret. And relationships struggle. Because of our brokenness, because of our dysfunction, we struggle. There's a lot of conflict maybe in your relationship. One person maybe seems to have all the power or all the control or say so, and the other person feels disempowered or powerless. There's a lot of blame shifting. Nothing's ever uh, your fault or there's no emotional connection. There's a growing resentment, tension, frustration, criticism, disrespect, violation of personal boundaries, all of it. These dysfunctional relationships lack the joy, the love, the peace, the fun that God intended. There's no building up of each other and no encouragement. Instead, we call the most dysfunctional relationships toxic. Have y'all ever heard of that? A toxic relationship. What do we mean? We mean by that, that this person or these people in the relationship are so dysfunctional that it's poisonous to the joy and the life in the relationship and with other people around them. And it's way too easy to point fingers to other people whenever you're having problems and say it's your fault. And if you were different, if you were better, this could be uh, a lot better. And that is true. But if we're going to talk about putting the fun back into our dysfunctional relationship, what I'm submitting to you today is that it starts with you. That you have to say, God help me first. A lot of times when I'm talking with couples and they're in crisis, it's not unusual for them to start saying stuff like this. Well, if he would just do blah, 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 if she would just stop blah, 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 and all the emphasis on is what the other person is doing. Now, here's what I've discovered over the years. That is almost never productive. What I find happening is when somebody starts barking at the other person, you shouldn't be doing this, you're always that way, the other person is not listening to that going, oh my gosh, I've never thought of that. That never happens. When you're barking at them, they get defensive and they start barking right back and both of you are pointing, if you would change, well, if you would change and nobody changes and it's very, very frustrating and you wind up hopeless. The relationship may not survive, okay? But here's what I've also found, that the only person you can control is you, and if you'll start focusing on you and you start getting healthy, the relationship is half better already, right? The relationship could be already already better. Now, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how to put the fun back into our dysfunctional relationship, and we're starting today with dysfunctional me. Okay, now we don't, have a, we don't have a screen up here today. We don't have a television screen. Listen, the enemy is trying everything he can to keep you from hearing this word. All right, I don't have time to tell you. I, uh, he's been trying to distract me. He's trying to distract our team. So we, we got issues. But So you're gonna have to look at the screen today, okay? But the title of this message is, see it right there? Right there. It's dysfunctional <laughs> me. All right, everybody say that out loud. Dysfunctional me. You didn't say dysfunctional you. You didn't say dysfunctional them. You said dysfunctional me. So don't think I'm talking to somebody else. Don't be sitting here going, oh my gosh, I hope she's watching. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't be thinking about texting them saying, oh my God, you got to tune in right now. PineLake.org. Don't do that. This is about you. This is about you for the next few minutes. Now, the scripture we're going to look at is in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have a Bible, open it up. You're going to need it. The scripture will be on the screen, but I want you to see it because we're going to show some relationships in the, in the text today. 
1 Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to be. I referenced this scripture a few weeks ago, but we're going to come back and kind of take our time in it today. The verse that I'm going to look at today with you, 1 Peter 1, is a verse where God has been opening me up, challenging me, and changing me. And if there's, listen, if there's ever been a time when I've said to you before, I'm just a beggar trying to tell other beggars where I'm finding the bre- bread, today is that day. I'm going to share with you where I'm finding help and life in the Word of God, Okay. So that's kind of the idea of what we're going to talk about. Now, we're going to start in just a second in verse 22, but let me give you a little running head start. When Peter writes this letter, he's writing to uh, uh, an eclectic, a mixed group of people, Jews and Gentiles, scattered around Asia Minor. They're undergoing Roman persecution, and he's trying to help them to suffer well, be faithful, endure this thing, okay? And so he starts off by talking about our salvation, that what God did for us through Jesus Christ, through his blood, that can never be taken away from you. So rest in that. We have a secure salvation. The angels and the prophets, man, they used to look forward to this day, but we get to experience it. And he says, it is amazing. But then in verse 13, he shifts and starts talking about how to live out this amazing salvation in the midst of hostile times. And so he's gonna give them some commands starting in verses 13 and following where he tells them to fix your hope on God, not your circumstances. He's gonna tell them to be holy no matter what. Don't compromise like everybody else. You be holy. He's gonna tell them be reverent toward God, fear God knowing that this salvation didn't come cheap. Revere God above all any earthly power, don't deny God, you're saved, you're you're secure. And then he says in verse 22, he gives us our verb, our command for for this section, he says, love each other. Because you're really gonna need to love each other if we're gonna make it through this thing together. Okay, you with it? 1 Peter 1, 22 says, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, here's the command, Fervently love one another from the heart. Why? For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Okay? Now, we're going to walk back through this. I'm going to show you a command that he gives, a prerequisite and a requirement to fulfill it, and then the, the hope or the goal, the result of it. Okay? So here's the command, love one another from the heart. Fervently love one another from the heart. God wants us to love each other. Love, love is the deal. Why? Because God is love, 1 John 4, 8 says. The one who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. Love is the way other people know that you actually follow Jesus, John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another, please hear me. It's not because your doctrine is pure, you go to church all the time, or you help a lot of people out. No, people know that you have love whenever, uh, that you're his disciple, if you have love for one another. Love is the greatest, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest is love. Why? Faith is going to go away one day. You're not going to need faith when you see Jesus face to face. You're not going to need hope whenever all hope is realized, right? That was the message from Easter, right? This this, uh, ultimate hope that we have. We won't need hope then. But love, love's going to be with us throughout all eternity. As a matter of fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you can preach like a champ, you can sing like an angel, you got gifts out the wazoo, awesome. But if you you don't have love, you're nothing. He didn't say you're, you know, you're missing. He says you're nothing. Isn't that crazy? Love's what you were made for. You were made to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we were made to love one another. Now, here's what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that God wants to put fun back into our dysfunction, but love is the key to that fun. It's when you learn to love like what? Peter's talking about that all of a sudden you begin to experience life and joy and encouragement and blessing in relationship. Now let's look at the command again, verse 22, that last part, fervently love one another from the heart. And I'm going to leave that up there and we're just going to look at the details of, of that command. He says, by command, love one another. It's a choice. I told you it's the fourth command in this section. 
He's already told them, fix your hope, verse 13. Be holy, verse 15. Be reverent toward God, verse 17. Now, love one another. He's commanding it, which means it doesn't matter if you really feel like loving. This is something deeper. This kind of love is a choice you make. It's an action you take. It's a lifestyle you cultivate. What if I don't feel like fixing my hope on Jesus and I'm really weak? Do it anyway. What if I don't feel like being holy? I really want to act like a hooligan. Be holy anyway. I don't really feel like revering God. Get over it. All right? You, you understand? So when it comes to love, when he says love, he's not saying as long as you feel like it, as long as they're worthy and doing what you want them to do. That's not it. Love is a choice that I'm making, you're making, regardless of what anybody else says to do. This kind of love is sacrificial. There are four different Greek words that he could have chosen to communicate love, each emphasizing a different maybe aspect or nuance of love, but the one he picked is a word used to describe the Christ-like sacrificial love given to us. It's a love, listen, it's a love that prefers you over me. It's a love that considers your welfare before it considers my welfare. It's unwilling to just abandon you if it's more convenient to me. When I think about that and try to picture it in my mind, I'm thinking about a, an interview I saw this week with a mom who last week resisted authorities and went into a school in South Texas to get her two children out. And they were trying to tell her it's not safe and she said, I don't care. I would rather die trying to save my kids than to sit here thinking of me, not thinking of them. Now, I'm not making any kind of statement other than to say, what kind of love does that? That's this kind of mother love. This is this kind of love that says, I put you over me. That's what he's talking about. This kind of love is reciprocal. Love one another. Love's not one way. It's not just, you know, uh, me always loving you, but I, I, you can't love me back. And there are some of you who struggle with that. You don't feel worthy of love. You never learned how to receive somebody's genuine love, and so it's a struggle for you, and you've got to learn to have reciprocal love. Others of you need to get over yourself, quit being a taker, and learn that you can't just demand your way all the time and everybody do what you need. No, you are here to love other people and help them, bless them. It's reciprocal. It's from the heart, which is kind of crazy because a lot of times we just assume it's from the heart. And so as I've meditated on that, I thought about, you know, why did he have to say from the heart? Here's why, because sometimes I think we love each other from the head. I'm loving you because I have to. I'm loving you because I'm supposed to. Come on, anybody, you ever felt that before? Don't raise your hand or you'll get slapped right now in church. But, but you're, you're doing it out of obligation. This is not something I really am convinced of or want to do. It's just snap, I got to do it. Right? That, that would be out of your head because you're supposed to. Another way that you can love, another place from which you can love, and I'll try to be very um, uh, kind or um, not too descriptive, but it's, it's a word for passion. There's a Greek word, eros, where we get erotic. You, you can love people, from an unhealthy, love people from an unhealthy place where you're just wanting to feel pleasure or you're wanting to give pleasure to get love. That ain't it. He says, love one another from the heart. What does that mean? I think your heart is who you really are. Your heart is the genuine you. It's the real deal. This is, this is who I am now. I want to love you out of my being. Now, now, if you're reading, it says, love each other from the heart. And that's the New American Standard Translation. All right, I seldom do this, but I, but I want to do it today. If you're reading the ESV, or if you're reading the King James Version, both of those translations actually add a word right before heart. It says, love one another from a pure or a purified heart. Now, why does the New American Standard not have it? Now, I, I'm going to really geek out on some of y'all right now, but I paid for a seminary education, and so I want to use it. Okay. Some of the earliest and most reliable Greek manuscripts have the word cleansed in the text. It, it means to have your heart purified. Not all of them, but some of them. And so scholars can't decide whether it should or shouldn't be, so some translations include it, some don't. 
But I think those who do include it, and for the record, I think it should probably be included. I think it's in there because it captures the heart of what we're going to learn today is that for us to love well, our hearts have to be purified. The word in Greek is catharsis, cathartic. There there needs to be a purifying of our hearts from selfishness, lack of forgiveness, bitterness, immorality, impurity, lying. Love from a purified heart, and it needs to be a fervent love. He says fervently love. That is a descriptor, a descriptor that comes from sports. It's a picture of a guy who is straining with everything he's got to get the last rep. It's a picture of a lady flying wide open fast as she can so that she wins the race, okay? Holding nothing back. The picture is that's the way that we ought to love each other in the church, that our relationships ought to be, I am in this, I'm gonna fight for this, I'll do whatever work needs to happen for us to make this relationship go the distance. Okay, y'all got it? Fervently love one another from the heart. Now, my question is, do your closest relationships look like that? Does the love that y'all have reflect a choice in spite of how you often feel to put each other first and out of the overflow of who you really are without mixed motives and with deep connection to fight to protect what you have and I'm not quickly walking away? It's what God wants. Now, I want to make a couple of observations. One is this. Relationships that often are fun to start with, but if they don't have love, they end up not being very fun. Start off, man, whoo, it's awesome, man. It was fire, it was lit, it was this, it was that. But if there's no real love, just give it a minute. It won't be fun anymore. Country musicians have been on this for years. Have y'all not heard that song that says... You ain't much fun since I quit drinking. <laughs> right? That's like, dang, that's true. That's actually, that's, that's true, right? When you get past all the CRAP and get down to what we really got, if there isn't anything there, it quits being fun. But I also want to say this over you that if you have this kind of love, even if it's not fun yet, by God's grace, it will be fun the more you do it. Because you got something to build on. And we're gonna see how it's gonna become. Your relationships are gonna become more fun, more life-giving, more blessing to you and others when you love like this, okay? Now, what's required? What do you gotta do to be able to to have this kind of love. Well, there's a prerequisite and a requirement in the scripture that we're looking at, verses 22 and 23. There's a command at the end of verse 22, but watch this. There are two participles, the first of verse 22 and at the first of verse 23. These two participles clarify, give understanding of what you gotta do to be able to do that, right? To be able to love like that, these two things are a prerequisite and a requirement. Now, the prerequisite comes in verse 23, the participle where he says, you got to be born again. Verse 23 says, for you have been born again. All right, that's a participial phrase. You have been born again, not of seed that's perishable. We're not talking about biology here. We're talking about an imperishable seed. We're talking about a spiritual thing that comes from the word of God. Okay? So, 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 so listen, for you to be able to love like we're talking about loving today, you have to first be born again. Now, now, again, not biologi- biologically. Don't be like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, a grown man who when he says to Jesus, what do I need to do to go to heaven? And Jesus says, well, you got to be born again. He's like, dude, how can I go back to my, mom, up in my mama's womb? That, that ain't happening. Jesus said, that ain't it. It's a spiritual birth we're talking about. And so, so here's what happens. Here's what's happened, I think, to these folks. When, when they put their faith and trust in Jesus, something happens. They're born again. What was dead inside them, now it's become alive. The Spirit of God's now inside of them, and now they have the very presence of Christ inside of them, and they have a love to give. 
If, you, if you've never experienced Christ, you don't have this kind of love to give. But when the Spirit comes to dwell in you, one of the first things the Spirit of God brings is love, Galatians 5, But the fruit of the Spirit is, everybody say it, what is it? Love. love. So, so watch it. This is not you going, oh gosh, I got to love more. I got to do this. And, uh, that is not it. The fruit of the Spirit, the result of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ in me. Holy Spirit, help me. That's it. Holy Spirit, change me. Now you own it. It's a, it's a prerequisite for you to love this way. You cannot give what you do not have. So I have to ask you, have you, if you haven't turned from yourself and your sin and, and turned to Jesus and experienced this new spiritual birth, then, then you'll never be able to love like Peter's talking about. I'm not being mean, I'm just saying in the spiritual realm, you do not have the capacity. It is not in you. But when you receive Jesus, the spirit of Jesus comes into you and he gives you the capacity. He gives you even the ability to love like this. Now, that said, can I speak a word about being in relationship with a with a non-believer, a person who doesn't have the love of Christ. When the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked to an unbeliever, the Bible is not being mean or judgmental. God's actually trying to protect you, child of God. You don't need to be in a relationship with somebody who's not a follower of Jesus because they cannot love you like you were made to be loved. They're not bad. They just don't have the capacity to love you like what we're talking about. And so God's trying to protect you. If you want to be a better lover, get Jesus in your life. He changes everything. So there's this prerequisite. Got to have Jesus in my life. Got to be born again if I'm going to love like that. And here's the the other requirement in the first part of verse 22 is you, you have to have your soul purified. It says in 1 Peter 1, 22, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul. That's a participial phrase. Both these participles are perfect tense. You you have to have your soul purified for a sincere love of the brethren. That way you can fervently love one another from the heart. When you accept Christ, watch me now. When you accept Christ, you are given the capacity now to love like you've never loved before. But you still don't manifest the ability to love until you let the spirit change your soul. That's what he's trying to tell you. If you're going to fervently love one another from the heart, you got to be born again, but there also is a soul work that needs to be done. Listen, this is why some of your relationships are stagnant. Your relationship hasn't grown in any depth for maybe even a decade or more. It's because if you quit growing, love quits growing. God's calling somebody right now. (laughs) All right, that rang the bell. If you quit growing... If you quit growing, your your ability to love, not your capacity as a believer of God, a believer in Jesus, you got it all. You got the capacity, but your ability to tap into that, it depends on you having your soul purified. Y'all with me? Uh, That's what he's trying to get you to understand. Now, around here we have three circle drawings, one for salvation, identity, life, and authority. And so I want to show you the identity drawing, which is the body, soul, spirit drawing. It's going to be on the screen. And so here, here's the idea. This is our identity. We're identified by the Spirit of God in us. Okay, you have a body, right? We have a body. It's where we're conscious of the world, our five senses, and we're living in it. The Bible calls this a tent. Our body's a tent. You ain't gonna stay here forever, but you have one, okay? But inside your body, you have a soul. This is an eternal part of you. This would be the, the place where you're self-conscious. It's comprised of your intellect, emotion, and will. Most people tell us it would be your personality, kind of who you are, Okay, but at the very center of you is a spirit, and this is the part of you, I think, that dies whenever you sin against God, and your soul then is dead too. It's, it's decayed, it's rotten. And so what you need is Jesus to come in to give you life in your spirit. It's where you're conscious of God, and he begins to regenerate then your, your spirit, your soul. Now, spirit and soul, watch this, spirit and soul many times are 
somewhat synonymous. They can be used interchangeably. I, I've got up there that from your spirits where you do worship and where you have faith. But you know what? You can worship from your soul as well. David commanded his soul, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not of any of his benefits, right? So, so they can be kind of, you know, the same. They, they are tied together. I think your soul and spirit are your new man. But the Bible, in my opinion, makes it clear that there is a real thin but real clear distinction between your soul and your spirit. And so everything we do should flow from the inside, the spirit, out. And we want the spirit to then begin to sanctify our soul and ultimately our bodies. But it all comes from the inside out. Now, here's what I'm learning, that whenever you, whenever you accept Christ... Your spirit, your soul, everything positionally sanctified in that moment. Acts 15, 9, Hebrews 10, 22. Positionally, man, you're already purified. Boom. God took care of you positionally. But practically is what Peter's talking about. He's talking about living out this salvation now. And he says you have to work on an ongoing basis to let the spirit of God purify your soul so that you can learn to love well. Peter's saying that. James said that. James 4, 8, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 1 John 3, 3. So Peter, James, now John, 1 John 3, 3. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he's pure. Peter, James, and John, Jesus' three closest guys, his boys, all say, you got some work to do. Paul, the greatest New, New Testament missionary apostle, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You got the promises in your head. Awesome. Now let it clean your heart. Let him clean you up. Peter, James, John, Paul are all saying you need to cleanse yourself at the heart and soul level. That takes time and effort but it's part of your spiritual formation, okay? So I'm gonna call time out right there and say, I love it that you came to church or that you're worshiping with us, but this is not the end. We're trying to learn right now how to get up out of here and let God every day work something out in me. You didn't come to church, Hoss, you are the church, right? You don't come here to get love, no, you are supposed to be one who carries love with you. And so that requires us to do some soul work. How do you do that soul work? How do you get a purified soul? Well, I, th I think there's a couple steps in it. One is I gotta get my bad stuff out, right? If my soul's gonna be purified, I need to get the bad stuff out. And I think you do that partly by confessing sin whenever you know you've blown it. Own it. Acknowledge that you've messed up. And just say, God, forgive me. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's a verse for all the narcissists who are with us today. If you just can't imagine that you did anything wrong, that's your verse. You're way more blind than you think you are. And only the spirit of Jesus can snap you out of that. All of us sin, but what does he say? But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, that stupid thing that I do, that stupid thing that I said, God, forgive it, cleanse my heart, Jesus. Confession is a part of cleansing you, right? But what do you do if you find yourself confessing the same thing every day? Don't look at me like y'all don't do it. You know that's a part of, part of it, right? It, the same thing you were asking him to forgive you about last night, you laying down tonight, you'll be asking for the same thing. You, it's been on repeat for the last however long you've been living. God, why is it that I can't tell the truth? Why is it that I get all defensive when people confront me? Why is it that I, I, I uh, image manage? Why is it, God, that I lose my temper or I get triggered at the slightest thing? Why is it that I can't turn on the computer without going to bad places? God, what is that? All right. That's bad fruit in your life. That's bad fruit in your life. You see the stupid thing you keep doing or saying. And if you confess that and mow that grass, that grass going to grow again. All right, come on, where, where are my gardeners at? 
If you got weeds in your garden, you can mow them, but you'll mow them again next week too. But if you want the weeds out of your garden, poison it or pull it up by the root. So, so watch me. Part of what Peter is saying, I think, to you and me, part of our spiritual formation is to learn whenever we have bad fruit in my life, why do I keep doing this same old dumb thing? Stop and say, where's that coming from? Not just God forgive it, but God, what's going on in me? What lie have I believed? What trauma have I experienced? What pain, what, what, what false belief, what vow have I made that has got me in this self-protected, messed up mode of dysfunction? I think that's what Peter is getting at. I think that you can do this to a degree on your own. So that when you see bad fruit and you go, all right, Holy Spirit, Psalm 139, this thing, show me what's going on. And I think you can learn to listen to God and you and the Spirit can work out a lot of the broken places and invite the Spirit of the Lord to come in and heal some broken places that you've carried for a long, long time. A resource that I've used for this in the past is a book by Rusty Rustenbach called Listening and Inner Healing Prayers. One of the first books I read about inner healing. I've recommended it to you before. If you have an interest in learning how to kind of get rid of some of the roots, listening and inner healing prayer, okay? But I would say to you, sometimes you need some help, at least in my experience. There are some things that, man, I, I, I recognize it's, it's, it's bad fruit, but I don't know, a bad fruit and a bad root, but I don't know how to get rid of it. And if that's the case, that's where you need friends and a small group, a counselor, maybe even a therapist to help you figure out how to get that out of you. If you had heart problems, where would you go? You would go to a cardiologist. If you were having trouble seeing, what would you do? You would call the ophthalmologist. If your brain was kind of, you know, you can't remember stuff or something's going on, you would call the neurologist. So who do you call whenever your soul is a mess? Well, you might want to call James Brown. He's the godfather of soul, right? You <laughs> call James, listen to a little music, and that might help you. The, the, the Greek word soul, the Greek word soul is suke. And so whenever your soul is a mess, you call the psychologist, the psychologist, the person who is trained to help you figure out how to get rid of the traumas and the pains and the lies and memories and all those things that are lodged in your soul, your suke. And so can we just say that that is not a bad thing? That actually could be a very helpful thing for many of us. Y'all know part of our journey, part of our story that uh, Christy and I for a long time have battled with depression and it would get very, very uh, dark at times. And listen, we confessed every sin we knew. We renounced every permission. We cast out every demon. We claimed every promise of God. We had the elders anoint us with oil. We had other people with spirit, you know, with special, you know, faith and whatever, get a word from God. They came, laid hands on us, prayed for us. I'm telling you, it was all powerful, but nothing solved the issue. As a matter of fact, in some ways, it frustrated it. It wasn't until Christy got in front of a psychologist trained to help her deal with trauma from her childhood that she began to go back and see some of the pain that was in her life at an early age that if it has not been worked out of her, these things out here, this bad fruit is triggered from this bad root. And so the trained psychologist helped her to be able to invite Jesus into those moments as a little girl and let him minister to her as a little girl and speak his truth, not lies, to her as a little girl. And as that began to heal in her, the bad fruit began to dissipate. You with me? Am I saying psychologists are the answer? Nope, I'm saying we live from the inside out. The Holy Spirit is the one but the Holy Spirit can use the psychologist or psychiatrist to help you. Now, if you're gonna go to a non-Christian psychologist or even if you go to a Christian one, you better be dang skippy about your faith because sometimes some of the tactics and whatever you might wanna say, you know, I'm not doing that. 
That was our experience. Yeah, no, that's not really for me. But you can invite the Holy Spirit to use, look, all truth is God's truth. You can invite the Holy Spirit to use counselors, therapists, specialists to help you deal with some of the deeper seated wounds, trauma, pain of your life that keep you from being able to love like you wanna love. So you gotta get those things out and then you gotta keep, uh, make sure no new impurities get in. You gotta start guarding your heart. Now, Peter says, this is the way you do that. Look back at verse 22 again. He says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. Watch this. The truth, he's been talking about, the truth is God's word. Whenever you start to stand on God's word, when you start to believe God's word, claim God's word, act in obedience to God's word more and more so that this becomes your way of life, now your soul begins to be protected by the truth. You have to take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we're destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Your soul gets cleansed. The more you say, this is who I am, this is where my identity is found, this is where my value is established, this is where my purpose comes from, please hear me. It's not, your value's not determined by the pain or your past or other people. God's showing me who I really am and that's changing everything, okay? So you fortify your heart by allowing obedience to the word of God to shape you in time and over time and the result becomes, here's the result, that you have a purified heart for a sincere love of the brethren. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren. God wants us to learn to love each other genuinely and honestly. That, that idea of sincere love, it means without hypocrisy. You're not faking, you're not disguising, you're not posing, you're not posturing, you're not pretending to be more than you really are. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about how this idea of hypocrisy comes from the first century theater where one guy would play four roles and he would run out there and put on a mask and play this role. He would run off and get another mask and come back and play that role, go over here and pick up another mask and he's playing multiple roles and we said that's gotta be exhausting to play all these people and remember which character you are each time. And we said, to just be true is so much better than trying to live an image, remember? Be true, same idea, this thread is woven through the scripture that God wants you to learn to live and to learn to love from who you actually really are, warts and all, and to be loved for who you really are, warts and all. That's the goal of the preacher every time we speak is to help you to live in this kind of love. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a sincere faith. It's not to get you to come back. It's to get your life to be transformed by the love of Christ. But I'm convinced that when your heart is pure and your soul is cleansed for a real and true love, that's when you become more fun. You become much easier to live with and life-giving to be around. I think whenever you're on this journey and God's doing this, all of a sudden now you love from who you are and you're loved for who you really are and not some image that you're trying to keep up. And whenever you finally are free to just be you, there's so much freedom and rest and peace in being fully known and fully loved at the same time. They know what a knucklehead I can be and yet they don't walk away. I know how hard to deal with you can be, but I'm not going anywhere. That's what God created Adam and Eve to experience. Genesis 2, 25, they were both naked and they felt no shame. That'd be a lot more fun. And I'm convinced that whenever you live like 
Peter's talking about owning your junk, man, getting it, getting it right, not celebrating your junk, but owning it. When you can own your mistakes and failures and shortcomings and sins more quickly, I think you become more fun. People who admit they're wrong and make amends for their wrong are easier to love and they're more fun to be with than those who can never admit that they're wrong. And if you bring up one way they might have been wrong, they get mad and say, well, it's your fault. That is no fun. That ain't any fun. But when you're living with a person and you become a person who says, you know what, I so blew that. Please forgive me. I should have never said that. I put you, I made you look so bad. That's on me. Forgive me. I don't ever want to do that again. I can live with that. And I think when you love like this, like Peter's talking about, you begin to give grace to other people. You can give grace to somebody else because you know you've been graced. And you know how much grace God's had to have on you and you know how much grace other people have had. So it helps you to be able to give grace to other people too in the midst of their dysfunction. I need to be real clear. I'm not talking about ignoring their brokenness and dysfunction. You're not acting like there's nothing really wrong. You're actually acknowledging it. Mm, You know, you're acting like an idiot, but it's because there's something broken in you. It's not about me. I see that, and and whenever I see with spiritual eyes and understand what we're talking about today, I can actually point out what the real cause of what's going on there. There's something deeper here, and I don't get dragged into an argument. I'm not all of a sudden defensive whenever you come back at me, and you can draw a boundary and say, nope, that ain't about me now. This one's about you, and you keep from losing your temper and escalating and calling them an idiot or walking away slamming a door. Y'all with me? It helps you to remain calm and have more grace. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter goes on and he writes, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Doesn't act like it's not there. It just says, I love you and I'm willing to work with you. As long as you're willing to work, let's, let's go. And I'm finding that that's a lot more fun. And it's a lot more fun whenever you can actually, having done a little bit of soul work, you can begin to laugh at Life, and you can laugh at yourself. All of us are broken, and all of us are prone to do stuff, to self-protect, or to numb our emotional pain, or hide behind a mask. But once you recognize that, and you begin to see it, and somebody calls it out, if if you're growing, you can, instead of getting defensive, you can go, dang it, you're right, I do it. My mom and dad were at my house this week and my mom it's just me and Christy and my mom and dad my mom looks at Christy and says you are so amazing we're so lucky to have you in our family you are a good one Chip brought home some real losers but you're a good one (laughs) brought home some losers now listen there was a day and time when if my mom said that I would have on the inside gone off. Now, I would not have said a word on the outside. My outside, I would have presented myself socially as very calm. At least that's what my counselor's telling me. I would have presented very calm, but there would have been a storm inside of all kind of, well, you my life. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, that would have set me off. I'd have been scared. Of, oh my gosh, you cannot mention old girlfriends around my wife. The fear would have come up in me like that. But thank God, by grace, he's helping cleanse my soul, and I'm changing. You go, you know know what? That is probably true. Some of them girls probably wasn't what they needed to be, but you know what? I wasn't what I needed to be. And I was probably looking to them to feel something they could never feel. That's the truth. The next day, we were riding in my truck, and Christy said, yo, mama said I was a good one. <laughs> I said, you're right, baby girl. You a good one. She said, no, I'm a little crazy, but I'm a good one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you crazy. That was right, right? And we can, la- look, we can laugh. I'm not making light about that. We can laugh about that. You know the journey we've been on. There's been a lot of pain and a lot of tears, and I'm not minimizing whenever you find yourself in that place. But when God begins to heal and you can begin to recognize, you know what, in our weakness and in our brokenness, there's crazy things, but I'm a good one. It makes life a whole lot more fun. This ain't dysfunctional them. This is about dysfunctional me. 
And so God is inviting you right now to say, God, help me. Help me to fervently love other people from a purified heart. There's a prerequisite for that, and that is you have to say, Jesus, come into my life and give me a love that I've never had and I'm not capable of giving until you come. Go with me. And if that's you, if that's you today, and you say, Jesus, give me your love. I want to be born again. I invite your spirit to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and my selfishness. God, I give my life to you. I give my life to you. That's the starting point. You receive love, now you can give love. But even as a follower of Jesus, listen, you'll be stagnant if you're not saying, Holy Spirit, would you keep purifying my soul for this kind of sincere love? Maybe even right now you could pray, God, would you show me the root that's causing all this bad fruit in my life? Would you say, Holy Spirit, I, I'm probably not going to solve it right now, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm saying, God, would you take me on this journey to love better? I'm willing to humble myself and get help and take steps to be the lover you want me to be. Of my faith family, of my family and friends, show me. In just a second, we're going to sing a song that just says, I will make room for you. I'll make room for you to do whatever you want to do. Would you let it be your cry to God today? We're going to say, your way is better, God. Your way is better. And so today, would you just humbly say, God, your way is better. The way of the, the world, the way of my past, the way of my pain, what other people have put on me, God, that ain't it. I want to walk in the love that you give, and I want to receive it and then give it. Lord, would you do that in my life? Father, we love you. We bless you. We're going to respond to you in worship. There are going to be some who may walk to the front today and just say, hey, I need some help today or pray with me about my life. Whatever that is, God, we want to respond to you. Holy Spirit, we make room for you. Would you bring healing in this place? God, let truth overrule the lies. God, let light shine in our darkness. And God, would you bring courage even out of our weakness and frailty? Give us faith. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us first. Teach us to fervently love like you do. In Christ's name, amen.